So we are going to um, move on to our, our next kind of tough question, um, something that we need to think deeply about and solve in our education spaces and of learning spaces of all kinds, which is why and how. How are we going to do this co-design thing? What is this co-design thing? How do we do this? And we had some really beautiful examples earlier today, so we'll be able to build on some of what um, you saw in one of the showcases today as well. So we have a, a, a wonderful kind of partner in this space, um, Susan Rivers, who is the chief scientist for History CoLab, um, working with Fernanda Rain, who's also um, an LSX fellow you saw earlier this morning. And Susan um, also is the founder of iThrive Games. And Susan is going to kick us off for this panel. And you guys have about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll jump into then we'll do five minutes of questions, and then we'll wrap it up. I know. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And our friends online, hello, hello. Um, thank you for having us today. I'm Susan Rivers, uh, co-design. Um, is my design of choice. There's nothing better than co-designing with young people. Um, I get so much out of it. I, when I do it, I make sure that it's created so that they get so much out of it and often we'll get a product or a program from it. Um, there's so much learning, so much potential. And so when I was asked to come here today to talk co-design, um, I thought for half a second and then said, Heck yeah, I'm here. Um, so I want to start with my amazing panel of co-designers. Um, if you could introduce yourselves and say what co-design means to you, not define it, but like what it means in your life, why you care about it so much. Emer? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Emer Beamer. Um, I currently call myself a social co-designer with children. Um, and co-design is it's important because it's fun. It's important because the child gets heard. It's important because anything you're making for children, I just think it's a no-brainer. They should be included in, in the creation uh, process and the child learns from it as well. Hi everyone, um, I'm Maida Tare. I'm the Director of Research at the Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop. And uh, co-design is a new tool in my toolkit. So I've uh, trained as a traditional developmental psychologist. I studied lots of kids, and I did not ask for their opinions on the study when I talked to them. <laughs> um, so I, in the last few years, have learned a lot about co-design, and we've engaged in a lot of co-design now uh, through the, an initiative at the Cooney Center. Um, and I'm excited to share more about it. I'm a co-design interloper. I should say my name first. I'm Sarah Shapiro. I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Learning Innovation, or Ally. And um, I'm not a co-designer, but I talk and think a lot about education, research, and development, R&D. And you can't do good R&D without inclu it being inclusive R&D. And you can't do inclusive R&D without co-design. And you can't do any of this work without making sure that students and teachers and communities are at the center of it. So that's why I care about it. But I, the experts uh, on this panel are way more expert than I am. Thank you all. So when I think about co-design, I think about three or four different uh, targets. Um, one is as facilitators, we're creating a space where co-design happens. Um, there's the, the individuals we invite into the space to co-design with us. They're the co-designers. Um, there's the process that we're working on together in that co-design. Um, and then there's the thing we produce. And it might be a product. It might be um, an idea for a TV show. It might be a parent night that we're doing um, in the lovely city of Pittsburgh. Um, and so there's the product. But the, in the product, there's one thing that can be measured. Um, but the stuff that happens in the co-design process is also really important. Um, I think when we think about the LSX fellows and those in the room, um, you're often going to be the facilitators. And so, Maida, could you talk a little bit about the benefits of co-design for facilitators? Because some of us are like, oh, wow, that sounds hard. I don't, I don't really want to ask people to, you know, to do this with me. What are some of the benefits yeah. that you've seen? So one of the things that we've been doing um, at the Cooney Center is we have an initiative called the Cooney Center Sandbox. And so we've been working with various product partners over the last few years um, in thinking about how can they better center kids' voices and also the research on how people learn and, and develop um, to improve the quality of the products that they're building. And so we have also 
thought about all the different stakeholders involved, so not just the kids who participate and the product, the product that comes out of it, but also the adults themselves and what are they learning through a co-design process. So how is it almost a professional development experience for them to, again, have a new tool in their toolbox for design and to like be humble enough to take the kids' ideas so they need to be in a place where they're ready to actually make changes to the product that they're imagining in their minds that they, you know, maybe have gotten funding for or, you know, have built prototypes, um, but they need to be open to actually redesigning and developing. And so we do want folks to come in in a, in a place where they're in an early enough stage to do that. And we um, actually ran a study with, like a sort of a retrospective study with folks who had participated in co-design uh, sessions, and they talked about how not only do they appreciate the creativity of the kids, but that they built empathy and perspective taking their own perspective taking by working with the kids directly. So definitely a lot of different benefits. Yeah, thank you. Um, Emer, you've talked about um, expert facilitation in your writing. Uh, there's some great blogs um, that you've put out there that are available on your website. Um, and so when we do facilitation, there, there are lots of benefits, as Maida just said, but how do we become great facilitators? What do we need to think about? Uh, thanks, and maybe because uh, we're talking about co-design, uh, uh, hands up. Uh, who has done co-design? Quite a few hands. Who would like to do more co-design? Everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I was thinking about the question, and then I realized there's actually two sides. So uh, there's not just when you're in the classroom or the group setting. I think the bulk of the work actually happens beforehand by designing a good program. Uh, designing the, the work uh, activities you're going to do, uh, knowing what creative question you're asking, um, you know, what f materials you're offering, um, and having that all ready so that when you get to the space uh, that's set, you're a facilitator. And I mean, a lot of it's common sense. Uh, you know, you just have to be genuinely curious as to what's going to come up. Try and uh, um, not already know the answer yourself and just look for the validation, but actually be open to hearing something either completely different or slightly different. Um, I think there's, you have to be aware of the power dynamics as well, especially if you're working with children, because you're the adult. They're used to you being the uh, owner of, of the right answer and then learning it. So um, we find it good to s be explicit. In this situation, children, um, we don't know the answer and you're going to help us with your perspective. Um, there's no wrong answers and, and make those kind of game rules clear uh, so that they know uh, what, what's being asked of them and that they are genuinely allowed to uh, say, well, I just think it's boring or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, the power dynamics. And another thing I find, uh, and that's kind of an ethical consideration, I find it really important that uh, as a facilitator that you're transparent to the children. So if you're only asking them for their ideas and you're going to give one idea two minutes to the principal and that's all that's going to happen with it, not brilliant, but be honest, you know? Because children could think like, oh, I told that lady that we need a slide in the bathroom. Um, probably they're going to build it, you know? And y you have to be honest that what's going to happen. Um, I, I think that's really important because the worst thing could be that children would do a couple of sessions and then go, oh, they're always asking me for my ideas, but nothing ever happens, you know? So. Um, uh, yeah, being transparent. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Sarah, in the space of R&D for education, what role does co-design have to play in that? And how are you thinking about that and the work you're doing with Ally? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so Ally, just very quickly, um, I lead a, it's a coalition, it's a new nonprofit coalition that brings together philanthropy, education nonprofits, researchers, and others to advocate for more R&D infrastructure and in education. Um, so, what, but like, 
what does that mean, right? It's it's more money, of course. It's more money for slides and bathrooms if if we need them, right, Emer? Um, but really, it's it's about more federal funding for this because we know that we underfund R and D and education as compared to every other sector in our economy. You think about the money we spend in R and D and agriculture and health, in energy. It's astronomical defense. Oh my gosh, the budget is wild. Um, we don't have that same sort of investment in education. So we think it's long overdue. And so we're talking about money, we're talking about a policy agenda and setting policy conditions in place such that good R&D can happen. Both, it can be funded at the federal level, but it can happen at the state and district level, the classroom level, in ways that benefit students. Um, and we think a lot about that R&D agenda. How can it be community and learner centered? And how can those policy conditions and that funding make sure that it is? Um, so we think a lot about what does it mean really to break down the silos between what happens in academic institutions, colleges and universities where they do a lot of that research, breaking down those silos and, and fixing that research to practice pipeline that we've been talking a lot about today, but that that can be broken. So co-design is so central to that and making sure that it's funded at levels such that R&D really represents the needs of the stakeholders that are most important that we've been talking about all day, students and educators and communities and families. So co-design is so much a part of that work. And, and Ally led a task force on inclusive research and development, inclusive R&D. And a lot of the things and the recommendations that we came to were really about how do we get co-design out? In, like, how do we fund it? How do we make sure that research dollars get into the hands of practitioners and students? How do we make sure that the grant applications we put out there in the world are actually incentivize inclusive R&D? Um, things like that. So we're thinking a lot about the policy conditions that make co-design possible. And again, co-design interloper, but think it's critical to making sure that our R&D infrastructure serves the needs of our students. Thank you. So how do we make the case for co-design when we want to be building it into our projects or pitching it to our boards or um, someone who wants to hire us to do a project for them? How do we, because it takes time. Right, it's not something you can scale up. There's not like a box you can pull off the shelf and you know, co-design can be done in 15 minutes and you have all the answers. It takes time. You need to be really humble when you're doing it. You need to create safe space for it. How do we, what do we need to do to make the case for it, to really convince our partners and the sectors that it's really worth doing? And this is a question for all of you. Vera, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, I, I'll jump in and just say, I, I don't think we have the, the long-term data yet, and that's something that the CUNY Center is thinking about. You know, when you wanna help s somebody who's making something in an early stage, it's gonna be a long time before that product is in a school and used by kids and teachers, and you can use existing measures to uh, show impact um, and, and how it might impact learning. So following that trajectory is, is, is is time consuming and also needs an investment. Um, we're hoping to work on more of that in terms of at least tracking the impact of co-design with the partners that we work with in the next few years. Um, but I also think it would be great to have, you know, Yalda mentioned earlier the AIR study that they did where they looked at when you have a diverse cast in a show or a movie that it impacts box office, like that sort of um, analysis is, you know, helps you make the case for why these practices are needed. So definitely something that we wanna continue to work on. Great, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I would say we need to make the case, like we need more case studies, right? We need more stories like the ones we shared today in this room getting to, I'm thinking specifically about policymakers in Capitol Hill. I'm thinking about people who review grant applications at the Department of Education. We need case studies and real examples with, to Meta's point on, um, we need data on why this is really important and we need, I know it's like anathema to like everything we've been talking about today, but we need to show the ROI and like why the money we spend on things like co-design on inclusive R&D actually yields results for students. So we need those case studies, we need the data to, to that point, and we need to be able to bring them and bring those 
those constituents to their lawmakers and say, this is what this meant for me, and this is what it could mean for other students and other communities like mine. Yeah. Thank you. Emer? Um, I think I have two different uh, takes on it. Like one, uh, uh, I forgot to say, I'm also the founder of Designathon Works that teaches children to design for a better world in a uh, multiple countries on multiple continents. Um, so, and, and prior to that, uh, sorry, that was a segue. Um, when you design programs together with stakeholders, so not just the children, but you know, in a school setting with the parents, with the teachers, and with the principals, those programs go, uh, go the, the, the journey, they stay, because people are invested they've put their, their idea is now come and they'll fight for it to continue. So, um, you know, it's not a plan on the shelf for that some consultant has written that never gets implemented. The people in the room made it and they're gonna make it happen and they're gonna defend it. So uh, I've, yeah, uh, I've seen that happen so many times. Like I, I've seen programs that I was there at the beginning and I come back 10 years later and they're like, oh yeah, we have this amazing program and was started and they've like completely forgotten I was ever part of it. <laughs> and that's like a really good uh, KPI. Uh, um, and then the other thing, uh, not necessarily related, is, is how can we convince more folk that the how, the how part? Because I think maybe people hear co-design and they're like, jeepers, what, what would that be like? Whereas it can also just be called uh, collaboration or um, participatory working, you know, maybe we need to de demystify the language a little bit and, and, and have the how just be a little bit clearer, because to be honest, you're just getting together and, and okay, you can do it very well, but you can, you can step up and do a fairly reasonable job easily enough. So the how, I think, puts a lot of people off if we could make that more accessible. Yeah, I agree. There's something about the, um, it is collaboration. It, there, there's other words we could use. There's something about a power sharing that I think is really powerful mm -hmm. in co-design. And <clears throat> you can't have ego. And I think like that's, that's a really hard thing when people are resistant to it, present company excluded. But a lot of people, like, my idea is great. I don't necessarily want to involve other people in helping me make it better. I just, like, this is good, right? Right? Um, and you need to drop that because true co-design, you are sharing power. Um, and that's incredibly powerful for young people, for parents, for your different constituencies. Um, I remember one, I do a lot of co-design with teens, and, and I hear some version of this in almost every session. I, adults don't listen to me. You're actually listening to me. And it's so profound that a young person who's been in school their whole life hasn't had the experience of an adult listening to them. And so that's the power of co-design. Um, that's the ROI of that person being seen and heard. Sarah? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think that that's so powerful, that in authentic engagement and that ownership of the final product, whatever that is, if it's a tech product, if it's a new process or tool that you implement in school, no educator wants to be told you will do X program for X number of hours with your kids in third grade. They wanna co-create something, they want to, they want to feel ownership over that work. They want that, you know, and I think it's a critical piece of that last mile, be, you know, that that we need to close between what the kind of research that happens in universities and colleges and the kinds of like tools, processes, things, you know, that we want to see in schools. And that ownership and that authentic engagement feels, it is, I think, that tool in closing that last mile. Can we open to questions? Yes, sway in the back. Uh, all right, hi everyone. My name is Maria uh, Nikolaev. I work at Stride K-12 as a um, user and product researcher. Um, I wanted to say, like once you started, like open this panel, that maybe 
we could combine like our second panel and the third and use co-design as assessment tool. Yeah. And I did this recently and it was amazing. So we had a game, learning game, for high schoolers that was missing, um, missing instructions. So what we asked, we asked as a research team for the teens to come up with the instructions. And then we structured like the the questions, we said like, so what is this game trying to teach you? What do you need to do? Create instructions for the future players. And not only we got like a great set of instructions, we got the user testing <laughs> done and we also got the, you know, we understood the gaps in their learning, whether they understood what they're trying to learn or not. So it was amazing and now I'm gonna always do um, co-design <laughs> when appropriate. I mean, co-design is learning. I mean, I think it can be a way that we do learning in schools and classrooms. Sarah. Hi, I just want to build on something that Emer had just mentioned, which is, you know, there's something in the language of co-design that suggests that it's at the beginning phase of the work, while really it is an iterative process. And we really want to partner and collaborate with those and not just be extractive and you know, um, voyeuristic, <laughs> but truly listen and create sort of a spiral. So I just wanted to note that. Hi everyone, I'm Telly Davudi. I'm a developmental psychologist uh, working at Gallup. Um, so Meta mentioned that um, when in developmental psychology, foundational research, of course, we don't ask children about how to design our research studies. And I'm wondering how do we go about that, right? How, how do we do co-design when we're not actually designing products? Um, and, and I guess one way, one step closer to what that would look like is figuring out from children. So I've worked with three to 12 year olds, figuring out from them what concepts that we want to study perhaps look like to them? What are these concepts to them? Um, and um, instead of the assumptions, the researcher assumptions, right? That is one way, and I've sort of tried to do that a little bit, but I'm very, very much curious as to how else this could look like when you're working with young children and you're not necessarily designing products. That's a great question. And I think, Dina, you kind of alluded to it earlier too, like before you jump into a new study, like before you design what you think the questions should be kind of crowdsourcing a little bit of like what kids already know about that topic or feel about that topic. But I'm hoping to Roberta or Dina or Kathy sharing what your thoughts are. I'll, I'll just say very briefly, I don't, think there, I don't think there's one way to do it, which I think is part of what people find intimidating. Maybe perhaps I will speak especially for the, the research sector uh, where things tend to be a little bit more linear and, and tend to really lead into the, the hierarchy, um, you know, whether that's of the academy or of the, you know, I'm the expert and, and I need to sort of study and extract that resource from you. I think that once you break that open that you end up with so many other ways to be able to, to do it. So, so one of the ways that we've done it um, in my lab is through community-based science, um, is through working, not with super young children in this case, but working with community members to find out, okay, what, what is it that you even want to study? You know, I think I have some questions. I know where the gaps in the literature are because I've read the scientific journal articles, but you, you live here, you live in this environment, you are experiencing these things. Let's start with what are even the questions that we should tackle and even just opening up the conversation, like, like those teens that you were describing, oh, no one's ever asked me that before. They've invited me to collect data on this project or maybe they've invited me to help uh, publicize something that has already been collected, but to start by what are the questions that we should even be asking, I think is a really powerful way to go about it. Can I answer? Yeah, I totally agree, and I'll just give you one other example because it, it might spark something for you. So we have the Playful Learning Landscapes. You heard a little bit about it in Fraction Ball. And the way we start a lot is we kind of have an idea of where we're going, but then we open it up to the kids to break it loose. 
So for example, in our very first project, Roberta and I thought, wouldn't it be super cool if you could have learning in everyday spaces, like a bus stop, right? Which is where people sit, especially in underserved environments. They go every day to the bus stop. Okay, so what could we do there? And we actually, now that was where we went in, okay? And they said, what kind of cool things would you want at a bus stop? And out of that came things like puzzles. Well, that's cool, because in the developmental literature, puzzles relate to later STEM. So if we can put up a number of puzzles and make it so it'd be different each time that the kid came, you know, three different puzzles, and they have two different puzzles on each side. So that was wonderful. Then we said to the community, well, what should this look like? And they said, well, actually, in the Philadelphia community, what it should look like is we should celebrate that Martin Luther King gave a speech here. And it was a Freedom March speech, and we wanted to represent Philadelphia, and so, Fine, we can make a puzzle out of anything, right? As a scientist, you know that. Puzzles could be whatever. So we went and did a puzzle, but they helped design that puzzle, okay? We still studied STEM. Final thing to tell you is when we went to Santa Ana, they didn't really want a puzzle, okay? They weren't interested. In Santa Ana, mostly a Latina community, mostly from Mexico, they said, well, what we want at the bus stop is the game Loteria. And a, did I pronounce it right? Okay. <laughs> um, so, so we said, okay, but you have to help us design it. And you have to say what the cards would be. And we could help gently guide how the science was going to be a part of it. Memory, attention, all that stuff got built into the Loteria game. And that's what's now going to be in Santa Ana. I, uh, I just wanted to add that I've seen this, you know, sort of a version of the co-design in um, some kindergarten classrooms I've visited, whether it's, um, you know, children and teachers co-designing the dramatic play area, um, or even in a lesson, there are certain content objectives that the teacher is trying to um, you know, meet, but say a lesson about frogs that I observed started out by asking the teacher, or I mean asking the students, uh, what do you already know about frogs? What are you interested in learning about frogs? And then that way she like, she knows what they already know, she knows what she needs to teach them, but also there's that opportunity to learn the things that they're really interested in. Amazing. Well, I would like this conversation to go on a lot longer, but I have been given the stop sign. So thank you all so much.